MRI makes certain tissues disappear like magic. Is this Hogwarts? Is Harry Potter out here casting some spells? Or is it just the critical role of the inversion recovery? And what about those hidden trade-offs between speed, contrast and signal-to-noise ratio on these sequences? Today we are answering all these questions, but first, grab your coffee, everything MRI signal to tune, kick it in. When we talk about inversion or recovery, we usually refer to a pulse sequence that is commonly used to selectively know the signal of certain tissues. Two of the most common inversion recovery techniques routinely used in clinical practice are the STIR and the FLARE sequence. But before diving into the nitty gritty of these techniques, let's briefly discuss the physics that characterize inversion recovery sequences. We can think of inversion recovery as a magnetization preparation technique followed by a spinecotype image sequence in its standard version. We covered Spineco and specifically Turbo Spineco in the last video, so if you missed it, check it out. The sequence begins with a 180 radio frequency inversion pose that flips the longitudinal magnetization into the opposite direction. Due to the longitudinal relaxation, this magnetization recovers towards its equilibrium value, passing through what we can call a no point. Now, to measure the signal, a 90 degree RF excitation pulse is applied, converting the longitudinal magnetization into the transfer magnetization. But here is the key. The delay between the 180 inversion pose and the 90 degree excitation pose defines a critical parameter in inversion recovery, which we call inversion time. As spins relax back towards the equilibrium, the signal for each tissue types evolved from negative, passes through zero at the null point and recovers to positive. This recovery rate depends on the tissue longitudinal relaxation time, meaning the T1, which itself varies with the magnetic field strength. For example, a 1.5 Tesla, the fat has a T1 of 260 milliseconds, while most of the other tissues like muscles of the brain parenchyma have T1 values uh, superior to 500 milliseconds. This difference means that the null point for certain tissues like the fat occurs sooner than in tissues with longer T1. And why this is critical to know? Because it directly impacts which tissue you suppress and the inversion time you need to use. For instance, is your goal to suppress the fat? Well, choose a stair sequence with a short TI, which is usually around 150 milliseconds at 1.5 Tesla. Is your aim instead to suppress fluids like the CSF? That's where the flare sequence shines. The CSF has a much longer T1 than the fat, requiring a longer inversion time, usually around 2500 milliseconds at 1.5 T. But do not forget, exact TI values might vary slightly between scanners and even radiologist preferences. So do not panic if your protocols are saved with slightly different TI values, there might be a reason behind. So how do inversion recovery sequences boost our MRI toolkit? First and foremost, sequences like STIR offer robust fat suppression, which is less sensitive to magnetic field inhomogeneities compared to spectral techniques like SPIR and SPIRE, which rely mainly on precise frequency targeting. This makes inversion recovery sequences more forgiving near metal implants like hip replacements or metal work in the spine, where susceptibility artifacts can really be detrimental, affecting not only the image quality, but also the overall image interpretation. Another advantage of inversion recovery is the contrast versatility. They can be paired with T1 and T2 weighted imaging, and they inherently combine T1 and T2 contrast mechanisms at the same time. And here's why. At short to medium inversion times, tissues with long T1 retain the inverted magnetization since their TI is less than their null point. After the 90 degree excitation pulse, 
This inversion leads to negative longitudinal magnetization, which converts to high signal intensity on magnitude images. Meanwhile, tissues with long tissue maintain bright signal. And if you wonder what are the implications of this, well, imagine like having a synergy where both the elevated T1 and T2 boost the signal with the benefit of highlighting complex pathologies like MS or tumors. And this ties to another key advantage of inversion recovery, meaning the broad clinical utility. And take flare in neuroimaging. It is an invaluable sequence which allows us to detect pathologies like MS plaques, infarction, but also hemorrhages. And moving to MSK, we know that STIR is extremely popular because it's critical to detect things like edema, inflammation, fractures, and any subtle lesions. But this is not all. Even in cardiac MRI, we have STIR that routinely help us in diagnosis myocarditis, while PSAR plays a key role in the late carolinium enhancement, aiding in spotting fibrosis or infarcts. So the bottom line is, inversion recovery isn't just versatile, it is indispensable across different specialties. But now, let's take a look at the other side of the coin. What does not really work in inversion recovery? Well, long scan times and limited SNR, these are quite two things we, as radiographers, we like to complain about. In fact, it must be said that the need for an inversion pause and the TI delays increases the scan duration compared to the conventional spin echo sequence. And if we want to be completely honest, that can be quite a deal breaker for non-cooperative patients or those that are significantly claustrophobic. Plus, having an inversion pause that reduces the available magnetization equals to less signal to work with, and therefore the SNR for inversion recovery sequences will be pretty limited. Number two, inversion recovery and specific absorption rate has always been a tricky tango. That extra inversion pause elevates the RF power deposition, exposing patients to greater SAR levels. And this unfortunately at times can limit the use of inversion recovery at high field strengths like 3 Tesla or in SAR sensitive cases like, for instance, pregnant patients. And if you are already frustrated by longer scan times, SAR conflicts forcing protocol tweaks or cooling periods will only crank up their annoyance. Finally, another pitfall of inversion recovery is that some sequences can't suppress specific tissues post contrast injection. For instance, the stir does not specifically suppress the fat, but it knows any tissue with a T1 similar to the fat. What happens is, post cadolinium injection, some enhanced tissues like tumors or inflamed areas might have shortened T1 values, which tend to overlap with those typical for the fat. So the concern is, we might accidentally suppress tissue structures which might be relevant for the final diagnosis. Okay, now that we have explored the pros and the cons of inversion recovery, let's dive a bit more into the practical tips for optimizing these sequences. First, never underestimate the inversion time. This is literally the beating heart of inversion recovery sequences and is tightly linked to your scanner magnetic field strength. I've seen hospitals with multiple scanners, 1.5T and 3T, blindly copy-paste protocols between them and then scratch their heads when stirs fat suppression was looking quite patchy and weak. But we touched base on the reason of this already, stir a 3T needs a longer TI than a 1.5 Tesla. The T1 relaxation time of the fat jumps from 260 milliseconds at 1.5 Tesla to 380 milliseconds at 3T, so the inversion time must scale accordingly. And just a brief note on this, when dealing with inversion recovery at different field strength, there are also other parameters and factors that kicks in along with the inversion time. Like for instance, in this example, we can notice a low image intensity in the flare temporal lobes at 7 Tesla, which is a direct consequence of a low flip angle because of the heter heterogeneity in the transmit field. Also, unless we talk about specific applications of inversion recovery like PSAR in cardiac MRI, we do not normally acquire the IR sequences like stir post contrast 
due to the possibility of nulling other tissue with a similar T1 to the fat, as we've just seen right before. So is that actually a way to suppress the fat post gadolinium injection? As a radiographer, we know it's not that uncommon to be asked to repeat a sequence post contrast, and bear in mind, stir is not the only option to suppress the fat. For instance, spectral fat saturation paired with T2-weighted imaging allows to selectively saturate the fat based only on the resonance frequency and leaving the four those guard enhanced tissues completely untouched. So T2 fat set could be the go-to sequences in these instances, and this is why it's important to know your sequence Achilles heel. At the same time, it must be said that there are areas where invasion recovery works better than other saturation techniques. For instance, when you have anatomical areas with a lot of interfaces between air, bones and fat, like for instance the neck, or when you need to cover, for example, long extensive areas like long bones, well, in these cases where there might be a certain degree of field inhomogeneities, sequences like STIR can be preferred over techniques that involve spectral saturation. As we have anticipated, inversion recovery are generally less sensitive to both B0 and B1 field inhomogeneities, and this is a factor to consider. I take against STIR as an example. Personally, this is a sequence I love because very rarely it leaves me with poor homogeneity of fat suppression, and I think it prevents me from a lot of headaches, even though it must be said that the Dixon sequence is becoming much more than an option these days and should always be considered a valuable solution when dealing with field inhomogeneities. So guys, that was it for me. It was a very nice journey through the advantages and disadvantages of inversion recovery, which are sequences that are definitely a common part of our routine clinical protocols, and they also play a very important role in uh, pathology detection. Did you like this content? Leave a comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel. There will be quite a lot of new educational videos that will come soon. But in the meantime, I will see you around.